It's kind of crazy to think about today, but there used to be a time when drug companies didn't even have to test their products before selling them to the public, right? If you look back all the way up to the 1930s, the market was flooded with all sorts of snake oil and quack cures neatly displayed at the time in an exhibit that one reporter dubbed the American Chamber of Horrors. Stuff like Banbar, a worthless cure for diabetes, Lashlor, an eyelash dye that injured women's eyes, even permanently blinding at least one and killing another. I mean, there was shit called Radithor, which was a drink containing radium that killed its consumers slowly and painfully. But Congress didn't actually move to clamp down on all this until what became known as the sulfanilamide disaster. You see, sulfanilamide was a popular antibiotic, and in 1937, the company that produced it, they added a new ingredient without telling anybody. Diethylene glycol, which is actually a type of antifreeze, which is something you generally don't want to put inside of your body. And so after some doctors unwittingly prescribed it to their patients, more than 100 people just dropped dead within days, including many children. With that, leading President Roosevelt the next year to sign the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which, among other things, required that pharmaceutical companies test their products on animals before giving them to humans and seek approval from the FDA before bringing them to market. And that landmark piece of legislation, it was absolutely fantastic for humans, but not so great for animals. Because right? in the decades that followed, hundreds of millions of rodents, birds, monkeys, rabbits, dogs, and cats were used for research purposes. And while researchers do not have to report how many they use, the advocacy group Cruelty Free International estimates that 192 million were used worldwide just in 2015 alone, with many of those going towards personal cosmetics, chemical toxicity testing, drug development, or drug discovery research. And these animals are kept in cramped cages, subjected to toxic chemicals and diseases, and then usually killed after they're no longer needed if they're not dead already. Now with this, technically there is one law that's meant to protect research animals from suffering, which is known as the Animal Welfare Act of 1966. But since 2002, it's been interpreted to only cover the cute ones like cats and dogs. So the rats, the mice, the birds, which make up 95% of all the research animals, they're not protected. Though I will say some regulations exist at the state, local, and institutional levels try to minimize harm. But then even for the animals that are covered, enforcement is notoriously spotty, so violations often happen. I mean, take for example, Dr. Oz, whose research between 1989 and 2010 inflicted suffering on and killed over 300 dogs, 661 rabbits and rodents, and 31 pigs, according to Jezebel. With a whistleblower alleging that his team did things like wait two days to euthanize a dog experiencing lethargy, vomiting, paralysis, and kidney failure, as well as keeping a dog alive for a month for continued experimentation despite its unstable, painful condition. And they said they injected expired drugs into the hearts of a litter of puppies without any sedation, killing them, and then putting them in a trash bag with other still alive puppies. Now, individual horror stories aside, and if you wanna really dive in, you can look online, there's way worse stories. But now with all this, something that's interesting about the field is if you ask researchers, usually they'll acknowledge the harms there were causes, but they'll also argue that the benefits outweigh the cost. Right, I mean, animal testing has given us insulin for diabetes, penicillin for infections, the polio and COVID vaccines, HIV and cancer treatments. And really, the list just goes, on and on, and so in short, we're talking about the kind of stuff that has saved hundreds of millions of lives. And this is we've also seen what happens when you don't do animal testing. Right? For example, thalidomide, that wasn't tested on pregnant animals before it was marketed to treat morning sickness. With that, then infamously causing an estimated 24,000 birth defects, as well as 123,000 stillbirths and miscarriages. But then also with that said, you might be shocked to learn how insanely ineffective animal testing actually is. Because right? research has shown that anywhere between 92 and 96% of drugs that work in animals fail in humans. With this due to a long list of reasons, first and foremost being that animals are simply different from humans genetically, physiologically, psychologically, and more. But then also a lot of other factors that you wouldn't expect can also affect the results. Like for example, the conditions of a laboratory setting, windowless rooms, artificial lighting, restrictive cages, which influence animals' biology and behavior. So for example, monkeys watching other monkeys being restrained for blood collection suffer contagious anxiety. Or similarly, blood pressure and heart rates elevate in rats watching other rats being decapitated. And then lastly, methodological issues in animal studies are common. Right, looking at 2,671 papers from 1992 to 2011, 75% of them weren't randomized, 70% weren't blinded, and fewer than 1 in 12% had sample calculations and conflict of interest statements, respectively. But all these factors, right, they don't just explain why we waste time and money on unsafe or ineffective drugs. They also explain the potentially safe and effective drugs we do not invest in. Right? I mean, we have no idea how many drugs we've thrown away because they failed in animals, even though they may have worked in humans if we pursued them. So for example, tamoxifen is one of the most effective drugs for certain types of breast cancer. But we wouldn't have known that had it not been on the market for years before we realized that it causes liver tumors in rats, though not humans. And so with that, you have this research paper noting that many 
useful drugs that have safely been used by humans for decades, such as aspirin and penicillin, they may not have been available today if the current animal testing regulatory requirements were in practice during their development. And so with that, you have the author adding that as medical research becomes more complex, where you're tackling stuff like neurological conditions, animal testing is only getting less relevant, not more. Right? For example, a 2014 study estimates that treatments for Alzheimer's that worked in animals failed in humans about 99.6% of the time. With Scientific American noting other species are no longer providing the insights about human biology, including at the cellular and subcellular levels that scientists today need to achieve innovation. And so given all these problems, it's no surprise that calls to phase out animal testing have grown louder over the past decade or two, with people pointing to alternative methods that they claim have the potential to be just as, if not more effective. Like for example, using all the accumulated data we already have on different drugs and chemicals to guess whether new or similar ones will work. With a 2018 John Hopkins study suggesting that doing this could predict a new chemical's toxic properties better than animal testing could. Also another study that same year from Oxford showed that a computer simulation of human heart cells predicted adverse events from cardiac drugs better than animal tests. And now with a revolution in AI, we can sift through that data better and faster than ever before. Right? So the FDA is actually developing a software that seeks to accurately predict how rats would react to any given chemical using past animal testing data. And there's a similar international project called Virtual Second Species that's creating an AI powered virtual doll. But of course, all of that depends on pre-existing data from research on real animals. So what if, however, we could generate brand new data without using any animals at all? But with that, say hello to this amazing invention called the organ on a chip. Right? See, these little bad boys, they contain little channels into which scientists put human cells and tissue. Then they put multiple chips together to mimic multi-organ systems and run air, blood, and other fluids through them. Right? So depending on which cells you use, you can make everything from kidney chips and intestine chips to lung chips or even vagina and penis chips. And then you can subject these chips to drugs, chemicals, viruses, bacteria, whatever you want. But the obvious advantage of this technology being that it is based on actual human biology, not fucking rats or monkeys. And huge thing, when a research team studied its effectiveness in 2022, liver chips correctly identified 87% of toxic drugs, none of which were detected with animal models. Also, they didn't incorrectly identify any safe drugs as toxic. With the study's authors estimating that the pharmaceutical industry could generate an additional $3 billion or more a year if it routinely used liver chips, according to Scientific America. But then also, if you think organs on a chip are cool, wait till you get a load of organoids. Right? These are small three-dimensional lab-grown blobs of human tissue that, like the chips, mimic full-sized organs. And the way that this works is that you take some stem cells, then by feeding them certain nutrients and genetic instructions, you coax them to self-organize into structures that resemble miniature organs. With scientists demonstrating this can be done for hearts, lungs, even brains, and organoids have been shown to predict human responses to cystic fibrosis medications and chemotherapy. Now, all that said, right, keep in mind with all this, animal testing isn't going away anytime soon, right? Because despite the advancements in technology, it is still the best method for researching certain kinds of drugs and conditions. And the alternative methods are not only novel, but they have their own drawbacks as well. But nevertheless, we've seen a gradual shift toward adopting these methods, or at least examining them more closely. We're seeing things like this year, the National Institutes of Health launching a $300 million fund to support the development, validation, and testing of non-animal alternatives. And that is on top of the existing 8% of its $40 billion research budget that the NIH already devotes to alternatives. Also, we've seen things like in 2016, Obama directing the EPA to replace the use of vertebrae animals in toxicity testing with alternative methods if scientifically feasible. And then Biden in 2022 signed the FDA Modernization Act 2.0, with that ending the requirement for animal testing in every new drug application for the first time ever. Though notably, that law didn't create specific guidelines, standards, or policies. And you know, the culture within the agency ensured that companies would still do animal testing to maximize their chances of approval, which is why in February of this year, Congress introduced the FDA Modernization Act 3.0, with that now aiming to require the agency to establish a process for qualifying new testing methodologies. But I mean, a big thing there, it's gonna be a long road to get these alternatives widely accepted. And I mean, even longer to get animal testing outright banned. Though I will say we have seen more progress in some areas than others, with most notably cosmetics and personal products, which took the most heat for animal testing because they couldn't hide behind the justification of making life-saving drugs, which is why today 45 countries and 12 US states have banned animal tested cosmetics so far. And now over 2,500 North American cosmetics, personal care and household product companies certifying themselves as animal free. But as far as what the future of all this will look like, for now we'll have to wait and see.